Good day everyone, welcome to this session. We're going to be looking at heat release rates and the cone calorimeter because cone calorimetry is a very central and important part of fire engineering when it comes to understanding materials and this is also a very important parameter when it comes to fire modeling. So depending on what fuel you have burning the behavior may be very different depending if you've got paper polycarbonate polyurethane or paraffin you're going to have different typical behavior of the material as it burns away but we want to describe it and we want to predict it but what becomes even more complex let's say now we have a very complex material that's burning a even if it's a chair where you've got timber and um, foam you've got uh, upholstery and various things around it they're all burning at different rates at different times so getting a lumped a total heat release rate from an item can be quite difficult if you're relying on individual materials for instance if we wanted just to do a single material, this is possible. So we take our, our burning item, we put it on a scale, and we measure its mass loss with time. And if we know what its mass loss is, we can calculate then the heat release rate with time if we, we record all the mass at different times. And our total heat release rate is some... Um, factor accounting for incomplete combustion let's say it's 0.9 or 0.95 0.8 depending on the material so 70 80 90 95 100 percent of the material um, energy is released we know our calorific value from a bomb calorimeter so we do a complete combustion material area of fire and our mass loss rate that i was discussing so we can get a mass loss of well from a mass loss we can get to a heat release rate and for a heptane fire or a polyurethane or something a, a single material this is possible but once again you put a chair on there and you suddenly don't know what's burning so heat release rate though is the one of the most important if not the most important factor in fire engineering so we want to know it and the important background information we now need to know is how do we understand combustion in relation to gas and oxygen consumption? So we know that air consists of these items here, and the oxygen, the amount of oxygen is very important. We've got about 20.95% oxygen, very slightly. And if we know how much air we have, well, oxygen we have to start with, and then how much Air or oxygen there is after something has been been burnt in the flue gases, we will know how much oxygen has been considered. I mean, consumed, and that's very important because the amount of energy released per ox gram of oxygen consumed is relatively constant. So, if we have the mole fraction of oxygen in gases in an outlet of a hood above a burning item, the volumetric flow, and have the density of oxygen, we can use the heat of combustion of a product in oxygen found in standard tables to calculate. So, if we know know how much energy is released per gram of oxygen consumed, the density of oxygen's volumetric flow rate, and then the change um, in the oxygen, we can get our very important heat release rate. So that's what we are looking for. And you can now start generating curves like this. So this would be the heat release rate with time for a sample. So for instance, in this example, this would be the input, or well, this would be the results of testing a sample, whether it's polyurethane or PMMA or whatever material you're testing, and you have a certain amount of heat release rate, 570 kilowatts per square meter, initial combustion, and then it drops down. And this was tested under different fluxes. So different amount of energy onto the sample, and then the more energy coming into sample, into the sample normally the faster it burns and so you get these different heat release rates this is often a direct input into a fire model depending on how you're doing your modeling and so this can be quite important so let's have a look at how you would generate this this curve and then the equipment and how the equipment works so this has all been standardized in the iso 5660 um, the different parts of the code the international code and this is all primarily based upon the works of Babrowskis, and this has then been pretty well the guidelines have been produced by his work and and others so now this is the the uh, simple sketch of the setup the main thing is you have a sample on a scale and we will measure the mass loss of that with time but then also we have a cone that uh, emits a flux onto our sample the gases go up the cone into a hood down pipe and then get forced out there's forced extraction there's a fan and so 
we will then measure the oxygen concentration with time. We can also measure other things, H2O and CO2 and CO, etc. But the main thing is the oxygen concentration with time, and then it all goes out. And um, then from the, the measurements, we can understand what's going on. And all of this is con um, connected to a very smart system. And we use the system to measure all the different parameters and then run the calculation. So the setup in itself is not that complex, but the real brains comes in the, the setup. And the, the videos I'm going to be showing you come from Ignis Testing. So they've built in and commissioned a cone calorimeter, and that's been used in the the video today. Here you see the cone which is he heated up to many hundred degrees Celsius and the temperature is controlled to emit a, the correct flux and that is calibrated and that flux then is emitted onto the sample below and that might be 10, 20, 50, 75 kilowatts a square meter being emitted from the cone. Once a sample has been prepared it's placed in the box in front and then the cone is heated up and once it is ready then a sort of a cover plate moves out the way to expose it to the full flux all at once. The sample is now subjected to the flux for a period of time and depending on the material you're using it may be very quick to ignition or take a while. There's an igniter just above the sample that's constantly flashing such that it, it, it provides a spark needed and the gases, the pyrolysis gases coming off the, the material eventually get to a concentration where they can ignite and then once it's ignited then the, the material burn is shown with the, all the gases going up the chimney. So in the final shot here, you'll see then there's the, the, the brain controlling the whole system connected to the setup where all the measurements are done. So let's have a look now at what you can get from a cone test. Once you've gone through all the setup and testing and got the results, there are a variety of very useful parameters that you can get. Obviously, the heat release rate is normally the most important. However, there are a number of other ones, including the total heat release. That is all the energy released from the full combustion of the sample. Then you've got the mass loss rate with time, which is linked to your, your heat release rate. You've got your time to ignition, which can be a very important, especially for easily ignitable uh, materials. You want to know how fast um, or how many minutes or seconds it'll be until something ignites under a specific heat flux. You can also get your critical heat flux. Sometimes a number of tests need to be done this, done to get this, but then you can know at what heat flux an item will ignite. You can get the effective heat of combustion, which is also quite important. So that takes into account all the many different parameters, how many, um, how much energy is released per gram of material or sample burnt, and then the total smoke release. With thanks especially to Ignis Testing who made this possible. We were at their facility filming um, the setup, filming their cone, and then we hope this is useful for you for the future. Thank you.